might just stop there. Order, Senator Askew. You will be in continuation being 2 p.m. We'll go to questions. Senator Mariel Smith. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Last night, the minister released a statement saying that she had received an undertaking from Naval Group that at least 60 per cent of the contract value of the future submarines build will be spent in Australia. What is the legal basis of the undertaking? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank the senator for that question. And yes, I can confirm that I have been having ongoing discussions with my French counterpart, Florence yeah. Parley, uh, to ensure that Naval Group delivers, uh, not only on time and on schedule, on cost and schedule, but also for Australian industry uh, capability and content. So we have had ongoing discussions, and as I reported back to the Senate and as my release, uh, we have agreed on a minimum of a 60 per cent Australian industry content. Uh, now that is, there are very strict guidelines uh, in the uh, agreement. We have the SPA with uh, France. Uh, for contracted arrangements, but there wasn't a specific number. So that is what I've now negotiated with the French government and also Naval Group to ensure that we have a minimum of 60 per cent. Senator Muriel Smith, supplementary question. At last night's Senate hearing, Naval Group revealed it would not make any contractual commitment to a local content target for another two years. Given the former Minister for Defence, Mr Pine, repeatedly asserted that 90 per cent of the build of the future submarines would occur in Australia, saying, and I quote, less than 10 per cent of the work will be done outside Australia, how is this undertaking now received by the minister any different to that received by Mr Pine? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, well, first of all, uh, there is nowhere in the contract where a 90 per cent figure is, is mentioned. Uh, of course he wasn't. Of course, of course he was not. Now, Order. Order. Senator Reynolds to continue in silence. Thank you very much. So, as I've said, I welcome the commitment uh, for 60 per cent, but it is very important to remember the stage that this project is up to. The project is still in the design phase, and even in the design phase, we've had many expressions of interest. Uh, we've had 1,500 expressions of interest and several thousand companies who've now uh, looking to work with Naval Group. However, however, as those opposite would know, if you are designing your house, if you're still in the design phase of your house or any other property, you do not go out and have commitments and contracts to deliver supplies before you know you actually what you want. So at the moment, at the moment, at the moment, we are in the design phase of this project. We will start going out. Neighbour Group will start going out and looking at contracts Order. in 2023. So time has expired. Senator Reynolds, Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Yesterday, the minister criticised Labor's strong advocacy on behalf of Australian defence workers and businesses, saying, and I quote, "Those opposite harp on about local content." Can the minister explain how advocating on behalf of Australian workers and businesses can be described as harping on? Senator Reynolds. Order. <laughs> I, thank, I thank the senator for that question. and I've got to say I think I've just heard the definition of hypocrisy. Uh, you would have far more credibility if those on, those on that side of the chamber, when in government, had commissioned a single Australian-built ship. You commissioned zero, so zero per cent of 100 per cent is still zero. You, you, caused, you caused the valley of death, which we have fixed through our National Naval Shipbuilding uh, Project. So please don't come and lecture us when you have no credibility whatsoever on shipbuilding. Order. 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 Senator. Order. Order. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. What is the Morrison government doing to address the scourge of domestic and family violence? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and can I thank Senator Chandler for the question. Um, obviously, violence against women and their children is absolutely abhorrent. It's as simple as that, and we must never, ever make any excuses for the sorts of behaviours that are perpetrated under situations of domestic and family violence. And this isn't just limited to physical violence. It could be verbal, it could be sexual, it could be um, emotional and it could be financial. 
um, and we believe that this must be stamped out in all its forms. And it is completely unacceptable that any woman or her child should feel unsafe uh, in Australia at the hands of a partner or a previous partner. And that is why we have a target of zero tolerance in relation to domestic violence. And we have committed the largest ever amount of money towards achieving that through the fourth action plan. But particularly, we want to make sure that men take responsibility for their own attitudes and their behaviours. And we want to encourage them to seek the necessary help that they need to change those attitudes and behaviours. Uh, last week, as part of the overall commitment um, of $340 million, we announced uh, $2.4 million to go towards four specific programs uh, to assist men to help them make the behavioural changes that they need to make sure that they end their use of control of abusive behaviour and other problematic behaviours that lead eventually to uh, a level of violence. And while it's absolutely essential that we continue to provide the level of financial resources to enable frontline services to be able to meet uh, the demands and, and respond to the issues that come before them, money alone is not going to change the dial. What we need to do is we need to change everybody's attitudes, but particularly we need to make sure that those attitudes are changed to start with respect. And it's very important that we make sure that the language that we talk about is language of respect for everybody. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline to the Senate what measures the government is funding to stop domestic violence before it starts? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, as I said, it is an absolute goal of this government to make sure that we respond to domestic, family and sexual violence. But we have an additional goal and additional responsibility, and that is to prevent it before it happens in the first place. And to that end, we will be continuing our campaign of Stop It at the Start. This campaign recognises that to break the cycle of domestic violence, we have to encourage adults to reflect on their behaviours, on their actions and their attitudes and the impact that they have on our children and about how children deal and develop respectful relationships. Um, it explains that our actions and our language as parents, as family members, as teachers, as coaches, as role models uh, are very, very important uh, in terms of determining the influence that they have on young people. Um, this is a three-phased approach. The first two phases are about bringing awareness to the issue um, and dealing with uh, uh, misinterpretation have already occurred. The, first phase, the third phase is about Order. to begin. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain what frontline services the government is investing in to reduce domestic violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, in addition to making sure that we deal with the issues of prevention, we are also making sure that um, the main frontline responders um, are showing real leadership. And we want to stand by the states and the territories to make sure that we work with them to strengthen their response actions, whether it be with services or whether it be with law enforcement. Um, but one example of the kind of actions that we think are really, really important and we continue to be committed to is the funding of the 1800 Respect phone line. This has become um, a, an absolute um, central pillar of the assistance that we give to, to women and sometimes to men um, when they are confronted with a situation of domestic violence to make sure that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Anybody who is confronted with a situation of domestic violence can pick up the phone and make a phone call and speak to someone who can assist them in making sure that they can give them the support and direction to deal with the issue that is before Order. them. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. My question is also to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. I refer to the speech prepared for Defence Force Chief Angus Campbell, obtained under Freedom of Information in September 2019. That speech notes and I quote, climate change is predicted to make disasters more extreme and more common, and warned the ADF will be required to undertake more disaster relief operations and peacekeeping missions given climate change has, and I quote, the potential to exacerbate conflict. What is the Morrison government doing to prepare the ADF for conflict in our region and beyond as a result of climate change? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Watt, for that question. And I can confirm that Defence does have a very detailed policy on uh, the impact of climate change and the impact on force structure. And as you would know, it is also in the 2016 White Paper uh, very specifically referenced. So 
uh, the potential for climate change and in our region and also in our nation is well addressed and well studied and by the Order. ADF. Order. Hmm. Have you concluded your answer, Senator? Uh, sorry, is this a, I, was just here, I wasn't sure if Senator Reynolds had resumed her seat concluding the answer or you were rising on a point of order. Senator Reynolds has finished, so we'll go to a supplementary question. There's something about what that is. So I ask a supplementary question. The speech prepared for the Chief of the Defence Force noted, and I quote, deploying troops on numerous disaster relief missions at the same time may stretch our capability and capacity. Does the Morrison government acknowledge climate change induced disasters pose a threat to the capability and capacity of the ADF? And again, I ask, what is the Morrison government doing to prepare the ADF for these challenges? Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks very much, Senator Watton. As I said, the 2016 Defence White Paper did identify climate change as one of the causes of state fragility, a key driver for our security environment, out through to 2035. And Defence prepares, as you reference the uh, CDF, uh, talking about as he does regularly. Uh, Defence prepares for climate change impacts on defence capabilities, estate, personnel, equipment, and also related operational uh, responses. And I think. Uh, you can see from Operation Bushfire Assist that the Australian Defence Force is well prepared for humanitarian disaster relief operations both here domestically and overseas. So I think the proof is, uh, Senator Watt, that we are well prepared and well capable of supporting uh, any, of the, any of those uh, disasters here in Australia and overseas. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In January 2019, the US Department of Defence released a report assessing the future impact of climate change on its military installations. The report found more deserts, bushfires, flooding and drought exacerbated by climate change posed risks to the US military's bases and capability. Has the ADF conducted a similar assessment? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I will say for the third time, uh, yes, the uh, ADF has done extensive uh, work on this and has prepared us for this. As order. I've said twice Senator, already— Sorry, Senator Watts rising on a point of order. Senator Reynolds, Senator Reynolds, Senator Watts rising on a point of order. Senator Watt. Relevance. This question was about whether the ADF had conducted a similar assessment to the US Department of Defence. It wasn't about some general Senator, statements Senator, the government might Senator have made. Watt, um, with all due respect, the minister had been speaking for 10 seconds. Um, I was listening very. I was. I, I, I was very. I was listening very carefully. At this point, I am more than happy to say she was being directly relevant. I believe your point of order goes to how she is answering the question, rather than being directly relevant. There's an opportunity after question time to debate that. Senator Reynolds, I cut you off. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, as the Australian Minister for Defence, what I'm doing is actually answering the question about the Australian Defence Force and the extensive work that we're doing here. So I cannot speak for the United States system or the United States Secretary of Defence and what his department has done. Uh, we are, and we have for many years in defence, uh, looked at the impacts of climate change and we work with the region in terms of humanitarian disaster response and many other support. So, so the answer is yes. <laughs> Senator Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Cormann. Uh, does the government accept the findings of the world's scientists contained in last December's United in Science report prepared for the UN Climate Summit that the world is currently on track for up to 3.4 degrees of global warming? And can you please tell the Senate what the impacts of 3.4 degrees of global warming will be on Australia's economy and how many people will die? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. As I've said uh, on a number of occasions now, in response to similar questions from Senator Waters, uh, the government uh, accepts the need to take action on climate change. And uh, we also uh, are committed to ensure that uh, our actions are both environmentally effective and economically responsible. And what we won't do uh, is shift uh, emissions together with jobs and economic activity overseas, where for the order. same level Senator of economic Coleman, out Senator Waters on a point of order. Yes, with respect, President, relevance. I've heard the general spiel before. This question specifically went to the impact on our economy and people's lives of 3.4 degrees of warming. 
Um, Senator Waters, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question um, as long as he's being directly relevant to it. Um, there's an opportunity after question time to debate the merits or otherwise of answers, which senators have. The minister to continue. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The, the reason why what I'm explaining to you, Senator Waters, is directly relevant is because what I'm explaining to you is that if we did not do what we're doing, we would make the uh, challenges for the global environment worse. I mean, if we were to decide uh, to stop uh, uh, producing and exporting Australian coal, and it would be displaced by coal from other sources, which is more polluting, the emissions in the world would be going up. So uh, if, we, if we decided, if we decided uh, to pursue the sort of reckless agenda that you're suggesting, we would be shifting jobs, economic activities Order. and emissions overseas, where for the same level of economic output, emissions would be higher. So the world environment would be worse off. Uh, that is why what I'm saying to you is directly relevant. Uh, the course of action that you're suggesting would not only harm working families around Australia, it would harm the global environment. And this government will never do anything to gratuitously harm the Australian people in a way that then also harms the global environment. Our agenda, we are committed to effective action on climate change. We are committed to take action that is environmentally effective and economically responsible. And we will not make uh, meaningless commitments without being able to tell the Australian people what the impact is going to be on them, their Order. jobs, their, their, their future job security, their future job opportunities, and particularly if it means making uh, the situation for the global environment worse. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The government's own inadequate 2030 targets are consistent with three degrees of global warming. Given that it appears to be government policy to heat Australia by three degrees, can you please tell us, to the nearest billion dollars, the damage expected to be suffered uh, to the tourism, agriculture and infrastructure sectors by your government's policies, or are you not costing your own policies? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, we, you're quite right. We are committed uh, to a uh, 26 to 28 per cent emissions reduction target, which on a per capita basis means that we will be reducing emissions by half, which on an emissions intensity of the economy basis means that we are reducing the emissions intensity in our economy by two thirds. And you know what? Uh, we have a target. The Labor Party doesn't even have a 2030 target. None. I mean, they are running for the hills. I mean, they're now trying to run some smoke screen. Some smo I mean, the reason, the reason why the leader of the opposition is coming out with a statement he did last Friday is because he knows that he can't get a consensus in his party room between Otis and Mr. Butler around the 2030 target. That is what that is all about. It's just one massive smoke screen. So we are, we are taking responsible action. We are being guided by uh, our commitment to ensure that our agenda is environmentally effective and economically responsible. You know, we will have to just agree to disagree. Uh, and the Australian Order. people, as Senator they have Coleman, done in the past, time for the answer has expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Do you accept the findings of three key Australian climate scientists reported in the media today that neither the government's targets nor a zero by 2050 target alone? will limit global warming to less than two degrees, and what is needed is deep cuts to pollution now and a stronger 2030 target. Do you accept that science? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. As I've said on uh, many occasions now, uh, the government uh, is committed to effective action on climate change, but we're also committed to ensure that the agenda that we uh, pursue is environmentally effective and economically responsible. Uh, we, we, will, we will not be uh, pursuing an agenda that gratuitously harms the future opportunities of Australians uh, in a way that makes, that makes uh, the global emissions increase by more, that actually makes the situation for the world environment worse. Uh, we want to uh, improve uh, the global emissions outlook, not make it worse. Uh, and indeed, uh, Australia is a net exporter of energy, uh, including a, uh, an exporter, of course, of Australian coal, displacing more polluting coal from other sources, uh, will continue to help reduce uh, global emissions uh, in the way that we have for some time. Senator Ritz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Can the Minister update order, the order, Senate? Order, Senator Ritz. I'd like to hear your question. Order. I know. It's kind to welcome senators asking questions, but I'd like to be able to hear it. Senator Rebecca. They always love hearing from me, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate 
on any commitments made to guarantee Australian industry involvement in the future submarine program. Order, the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. I was so excited, Mr. President. <laughs> I, thank, uh, I thank Senator Betts for his question and for his enduring uh, interest and support for defence and defence industry. Uh, I can advise colleagues that since my appointment as Minister for Defence, I've worked closely with my counterpart, the French Minister for Defence, Florence Parly, to ensure that the French government is supportive and that Naval Group is meeting our government's expectations for Australian industry involvement in the future submarine program. And I welcome Minister Parley's commitment to me and that from Naval Group that they will achieve at least, at least 60 per cent Australian industry involvement in the program. But this government is not just focusing on minimum benchmarks. I am and I will continue to hold Naval Group to account to ensure that it maximises Australian industry involvement as outlined in their obligations through our strategic partnering agreement. Through you to Senator Wong. This is an ambitious program capability, one that is also matched by its ambitions for Australian defence industry to deliver a sovereign capability. Our government's position is crystal clear. We are maximising Australian industry involvement. The Auditor-General recently concluded that we have the right partnering agreement to pursue this objective. The future submarine program underpins the growing strategic partnership between Australia and also France. And I very much look forward to continuing my productive dialogue with Minister Parley as we deliver this critical national security capability for Australia. Minister Parley and I have agreed on an ongoing process to review at our level the implementation of the program on a quarterly basis for the rest of this year, meeting again in France in April and Australia mid-year. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that extensive answer, and I ask: Can the minister advise the Senate what steps the government is taking to create a stronger and more resilient Australia by building Australia's sovereign defence industrial base to deliver the future submarines? Yeah. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thanks, uh, Senator Abetz, for that question. Uh, we are investing $90 billion to the create a national naval shipbuilding enterprise not only to deliver a stronger, more resilient Australia, but also to build a sovereign defence industry <coughs> right here in Australia. This will deliver major strategic, economic and employment dividends for Australia, but also for Australians for generations to come. Unlike those opposite, our record stands proud and stands strong. We bought the Air Warfare Destroyer and the Collins class back on track following Labor's failures during its times in government. We are exceeding, exceeding targets for Australian industry content in the offshore patrol vessel program, which is already now over 60 per cent. We are delivering the six of 21 West Australian built Guardian class patrol boats committed to by this program. And through our Hunter class program, we are guaranteeing a continuous naval shipbuilding program Order. here Senator in Australia Reynolds. for generations. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Thank the minister for outlining that extensive record. Can I ask, can the minister also outline to the Senate the government's commitment to Australian industry involvement in the broader naval shipbuilding plan? Senator Reynolds. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, this particular program is still in the preliminary design phase. However, despite this, we are already proactively engaging Australian industry to ensure Australian businesses are best placed to win contracts when the program enters production design phase from 2023. But today, already 1,600 Australian companies have registered interest in the future submarine program. Australian companies are already benefiting from their participation in this program in work such as research and development, uh, exploring concepts ranging from autonomous navigation techniques to new methods of communication. And just one example, Thomas Global Systems in Australia, in fact two examples, and Acacia Research in Adelaide are working on designs that will support the delivery of optronics, of radar and navigational data distribution systems for the future submarine. And of course, all 12 boats will be built using Australian steel Order. from companies Senator like Reynolds. Bluescope. But before I come to you, Senator Ciccone, I'd like to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of the Pacific Friendship Group of the German Bundestag, led by the chair, Mr Volkmar Klan. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate this afternoon.
Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Oh, it could be also those under there. Um, Australia's red meat sector has committed to being carbon neutral by 2030. Meat and Livestock Australia Managing Director Richard Norton has said, order, and I quote. Order, order. I, can I hear the Senator's question? Senator Ciccone, please. We continue. always do. And I quote, achieving the goal will put Australia head and shoulders above its competitors. Minister, is Mr Norton correct? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Yeah. So, um, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you very much, Senator Ciccone, for, uh, for your question. Um, and uh, and uh, he's absolutely right. Um, the, the meat and livestock industry um, has— uh, has made a commitment as the part of the, uh, the agricultural sector um, to work towards their contribution to making sure that uh, uh, carbon emissions in Australia are kept as low as possible. But just like the National Farmers Federation, um, the, uh, the meat and livestock industry is also part um, of the uh, commitment by, uh, by the agricultural sector um, to play a very important role in the Australian economy. In fact, uh, I note that the, the National Farmers Federation, as part of their global roadmap to, towards 2030, have also committed to increasing the output of this industry uh, to $100 billion. That's up from $60 billion um, to $100 billion, which is a very significant increase. And I commend the agricultural sector for the innovative ways that they are addressing the expansion of the agricultural sector and for those opposite for those opposite Order. I would just like to point out that uh, the Order agricultural sector um, is a huge supporter of regional Australia. I mean, if the Australian economy rides on the sheep's back, it still does. And the, the fact that the Australian agricultural sector, whether it's through meat and livestock, whether it's through the grains industry, our fabulous horticultural sector and marvellous wine industry, they all understand that the Australia's future is going to be built on a, a, a future that does address the issue of, of carbon emissions. Um, however, as the leader in this place has said, constantly, the Australian government, the Australian Morrison government is not going to recklessly commit to a target at 2050 like you Order. are just because you think it's a good Order. idea. We will be targeted in our focus about how we address our economy and emissions. Order. Order. I would like to hear Senator Ciccone's question. Thank you, Mr Order. President. And I'll call you when there's silence. Senator Ciccone. ABES estimates that over the last two decades, more than $1 billion that's right, $1 billion has been wiped from annual agricultural production due to climate change. Does the minister accept the University of Melbourne's recent findings that failure to reach net zero emissions, which is required to meet our obligations under the Paris Agreement, is estimated to cost $211 billion in agricultural and labour productivity losses? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. Well, first of all, um, there was much in uh, Senator Ciccone's question that I would actually reject uh, the premise of. However, but what Order. I would say, what I would say, um, is that what we Order. are delivering as part of our policy, as Stra the Australian government, the Morrison government's energy policy, is what the Australian public voted for in May last year. Um, Order. And you know, it doesn't matter um, you know, what you come in here and say. The fact is that the Australian government is absolutely committed to effective climate action, effective climate action that actually delivers an environmental result. But at the same time, we're not going to be economically reckless. We are not going to put up people's prices. But uh, order. we will Senator continue. Senator Rustin, I have Senator Ciccone on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. On, rele Scone. on relevance, my question um, was very specific in relation to the University of Melbourne's findings and that of ABES, and I asked the minister to come back to the question. That was part of the question. I had trouble hearing the minister's answer during my constant pleas for silence. I'll let you remind the minister of the question. She has 17 seconds remaining. I'll call her to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And just to reaffirm some of the part of your question, uh, Senator Ciccone, I rejected the premise of. However, however, um, I would say that you know this government actually accepts the science of uh, of climate change, and we will continue to work in a responsible and effective way to address that. Order, Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. 
Um, given yesterday that the minister confirmed that the National Farmers Federation 2030 roadmap includes the goal of Australian agriculture achieving carbon neutrality and Meat and Livestock Australia aims to be carbon neutral by 2030, why is, is this Liberal national government failing to back Australian agricultural sector? Senator Rustin. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just draw to um, Senator Ciccone's um, attention uh, some comments um, uh, yesterday on, uh, by the NEFF CEO Richard uh, Tony Ma on Sky News. And, and I'll quote to you. Um, we've got a policy position. Uh, that policy position has been in place since 2018, and it's part of our roadmap towards a, a, a $1 billion agricultural sector. Uh, as part of that roadmap, um, we would like to move towards carbon neutrality in 2030. But this is the bit that you need to listen to, Senator Chikani. So it's not that we would be carbon neutral by 2030 or by 20, 2050, for that, mat that matter. What we have said is that we need to be trending towards a net zero approach by 2030. Okay, 2030. So I think you also need to be Order. very careful when you come in Order. here and make these accusations that you are absolutely correct in what you are making the assumption of, Order. Senator Jacobi. Order on my left. There's too much noise. Order. Senator David. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question. My question Order. is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Order. Despite On my left, sorry, Senator Davey, I'll wait till there's silence so I can hear the question. Please continue. Thank you. Despite recent very welcome rainfall, most of New South Wales is still drought in drought or drought affected, which became very apparent to me last week when I was with charity organisations in drought affected Molong. How is the government continuing to support these drought-affected communities? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, Mr President. I just wanted to be clear with the Minister that if she wishes us to give leave to Senator McKenzie order. to add to the Senator answer, Wong, we will do so. That's not a point of order. You know better than that. Senator Cormann. Uh, Mr President, that was not a point of order. That was just another demonstration of the juvenile nature of Labor politics in Australia and, today. And, and I've allowed... It's, uh, uh, I, 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 I will. I'll declare that 15 all, and um, two people have, who should know better, both making points of order that were not. Senator Rustin, to answer the question. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and, and can I thank fellow regional uh, senator Senator Davey for her question, because we both know that people living in rural and regional commu communities know that drought is not like fire or flood. Um, it doesn't just occur, it creeps up slowly, but when it actually takes effect, it has a massive, massive effect on our regional communities. Um, and as you rightly point out, we've had some great rain and, and we obviously want more, but it hasn't been enough to break the drought. Uh, and we're going to need an awful lot more rain, and it's going to be a long time even after those rains before our rural and regional communities are going to recover. And in your home state of New South Wales, you know, despite the rain, 98.8 per cent of rural and regional New South Wales is in drought, uh, with 22 per cent of them classified as in intense drought. And the Australian government is absolutely committed to assisting our rural and regional communities through this terrible drought, uh, with over $8 billion now having been put into uh, recovery actions and initiatives. Um, just last week, uh, the government extended its, uh, its drought community support initiative with another $82.75 million of continued funding to assist households who are battling this terrible, terrible drought. Um, it will take to, uh, the commitments that have already gone out the door $180 million, uh, and in New South Wales alone, that's $36 million that's been invested in eligible household support. Since May last year, the government has rolled out more than a billion dollars in grants and payments to support our regional communities. Uh, we've announced the appointment of the drought coordinator, Shane Stone, to make sure that we work with our states and territories, because it's really important that, that we work together so we play an important role of coordination, collaboration and making sure that we get the very best out of every dollar that's been invested so that we are targeting our farmers and their communities so that they are receiving the support they need. It remains a key priority of this government. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. And can the minister please explain how the government's actions are helping to build stronger and more resilient Australia for farmers as they continue to struggle with this drought? 
Senator Rustin. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, there are a ra range of measures available to farmers who are struggling with drought, and, and recognising that there is no one-size-fits-all model here, we need to make sure that we work individually with farmers and their communities to make sure that we are targeting and putting the right and appropriate drought uh, supports in place for our farmers. I mean, as an example, one of the most important measures has been the farm household allowance. It's a safety net. And it's there to make sure that our farmers have got the dignity uh, and the respect that they deserve during these tough times to make sure that farming families can put food on the table. Um, and also, in response to our, our, our significant drought conditions last year, uh, we uh, changed the existing drought loans um, eligibility and criteria through the Regional Investment Corporation to make sure that we could get money to farmers uh, that was interest-free over the next two years so that they would not be burdened with the interest. So we continue to invest in our farming communities because Order. we know they Senator need our Rustin. help. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And what support is there to help build resilience across the communities and specifically in associated industries like agronomy and farm supply companies that have seen their incomes fall as well as a result of this ongoing incessant drought? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. And uh, Senator Davey makes a very good point because it's not just the farmers who are impacted. Drought doesn't stop at the farm gate. It, uh, it it extends to the farmers, uh, to the, the mechanics who have to fix their tractors. You know, it might be um, the schools and the number of children who are, are actually going into town to be educated. It might be local businesses that are just so vital for the fabric of the community. Um, last month, uh, another 52 local government areas were applied and were successful in getting the million dollar drought community programs funding to spin, stimulate their local economies, to make sure that there was money in the economy so that the small businesses in these towns and allowed the money to flow through to these communities. And it's about making sure that we support the local tradies. It might be you know, local products um, being bought, local, uh, local jobs in the communities. And so in your home state of New South Wales, um, Senator Davey, um, $121 million has been committed to New South Wales shires to make sure that we are supporting the local governments to support Order. their Senator communities. Rustin. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Duncan Lewis says China is attempting a takeover of Australia's political system with foreign interference and espionage. My question for the minister is simple and direct. Is China a threat to Australia's political system and national security? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Lambie for her question. Uh, as uh, colleagues would know, uh, China and Australia have a deep and long-standing relationship, which is underpinned by the development of a comprehensive strategic partnership between our two nations. Uh, we have uh, the highest levels of uh, engagement and uh, uh, respect within, those, uh, within the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership and uh, its key uh, platforms. I think the observations that the Senator has made in relation to uh, the differences that exist between us are differences which we endeavour to manage with respect, acknowledging that we are very different systems. We are very different culturally and politically, uh, and we have, uh, as we all realise, elected to a democratic parliament, very different approaches to a number of, uh, of, of uh, key areas of governance. That said, though, I think it would be uh, uh, remiss of me not to also acknowledge the, uh, the depth of the uh, strength of the Chinese-Australian diaspora, for example, uh, in this country, which brings enormous richness and uh, support to, uh, to our nation and goes back uh, over centuries, a century at least, uh, Mr President. And for those of us who are heavily engaged in this area, in strategic terms, uh, we work very closely, but we make our differences clear in a respectful and appropriate way. I appreciate the concerns that Senator Lambie has raised, but uh, they do not lead to the conclusion on my part part uh, that she has drawn. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I'll attempt to rephrase my question to the minister to answer directly. Has China conducted foreign interference operations against any Australian targets? Senator Payne. Um, Mr President, I think uh, Senator Lambie has been part of this chamber for long enough to know and part of the relevant committees for long enough to know that the Australian government never comments on intelligence matters. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. China says that all suggestions by Australian media and security institutions about Chinese interference are fabrications. So I'm asking the minister um, what they're saying. Does she believe they're right? And uh, 
If she doesn't, then why won't the Liberal, the Coal the Liberal National Party support an inquiry into relationships with China? Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I actually missed the uh, the very beginning of Senator Lambie's uh, second supplementary question, uh, but I will say that in relation to uh, matters of foreign interference, no matter where they come from, this government has taken a very forward approach on those matters. We have introduced legislation, which has uh, been through this place and the other place, to address issues of foreign interference. We have, in the last week, for example, attributed a cyber interference, uh, particularly in relation to uh, actions of Russia, and. Their these are things that we take very seriously. We make those decisions and acknowledgement of those issues order. based Senator on Australia's national. I have national Senator Lambie on a point of order. Senator Lambie. Yeah, um, Mr. President, I'm simply asking oh, why sorry, the coalition. Senator, Senator Lambie, sorry. I'm afraid Senator Payne has concluded her answer. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Evidence from the Australian National Audit Office to the Select Committee has revealed that the Prime Minister's office corresponded with former Minister Mackenzie's office about the Community Sports Infrastructure Program on dozens of occasions, with one email stating, and I quote, these are the ones we think should be included in the list of approved projects. Does the minister believe the actions of the Prime Minister's office in directing the approval of projects for a political purpose was appropriate? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator uh, Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, I don't accept the characterisation uh, that uh, Senator Chisholm has put on it. Uh, the pro the, uh, the uh, correspondence that has been uh, released is entirely consistent with the statements the Prime Minister has made on a number of occasions. Now, of course, uh, the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office, like Prime Ministers in the past, uh, has uh, made representations on behalf of colleagues. Ultimately, the decision maker was Senator McKenzie. Uh, all of these things are along on the public record. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Uh, what direction did the Prime Minister or his office provide to the Minister's office with respect to the Urban Conge Congestion Fund? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think uh, Senator Cash gave an outstanding uh, answer on the Urban Congestion Fund yesterday. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that she made very clear uh, was that the uh, projects approved under the Urban Congestion Funds were indeed decisions by government, decisions by government, and indeed, uh, and indeed there was a whole series of election commitments uh, that, we, that we took uh, to the last election at which we were successful. The Labour Party had already been measuring the curtains uh, in the lodge. They had already, they had already uh, made all of the arrangements uh, to take over government. But of course the Australian people had a better idea. The Australian people decided to endorse the plan that we took to the last uh, election, including our plan to address uh, urban congestion. And uh, uh, these, are, these are decisions that went through the usual and proper processes of government. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, which other programs was the Prime Minister or his office involved in directing the approval or selection of projects prior to the election? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know, if, if the uh, senator has a specific question, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, in relation, in relation to programs, in relation to programams uh, funded by the government. Uh, you know, the uh, usual uh, decision-making processes apply, uh, and uh, you know, if, uh, again, if, 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 if the senator has a specific question, I'm happy to assist him. Order, order, Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. What actions is the Morrison government taking to create a stronger and more resilient Australia through supporting a skilled workforce for the future in the resources sector? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator uh, Rennick for the question. And I acknowledge that he comes, like I do, uh, from one of the great states that understands the benefits uh, that the resources sector makes to its economy, but also understands that as a government we have to continue to put in place uh, policies that will ensure the future of the resources sector in Australia. Because when we have a strong resources sector, the economy prospers, grows, and we see the creation of more jobs for Australians. Mr President, in terms of job creation, since we were elected to office in 2013, the policies that the coalition government has put in place has seen the economy create now in excess of 1.5 million jobs. In fact, with the recent labour force figures for January 2020, employment has increased 
by almost 250,000 jobs, and that continues to be above the decade average for jobs growth. We've also made a commitment that we will put in place the right policies that will enable the economy to create an additional 1.25 million jobs over the next five years. And to achieve this, Mr. President, we understand that we need in Australia a strong resources sector, and we need to ensure that Australians have the necessary skills that our resources sector need. And that is why, through the government's $585 million investment in our skills package, We've announced a skills organisation pilot in the resources industry, in particular the mining industry. The mining industry, as we know, it is strongly engaged with the VET system. The mining industry invests heavily in its workforce and in the training of the workforce to ensure that they have the necessary skills needs. We are committed to working with the resources industry to ensure that they continue to deliver and we as a government continue to deliver to Australians Order. the right Senator Cash. skills. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Why is supporting the continuing development of a skilled workforce for our resources industry critical to promoting economic growth? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, because the resources industry in Australia makes such a great contribution to the Australian economy. We rely as Australians on a strong and growing mining industry that is highly reliant on skilled, mobile and a diverse workforce. In terms of the statistics, the resources sector accounted for 8 per cent of Australia's GDP and 59 per cent of Australia's export earnings in 2018-19. That is something, Mr President, that the coalition government respects. The sector employed nearly 245,000 Australians at the end of 2018-2019. That's around 2 per cent of Australia's total workforce. We also have, though, as a sector, it is one of the fastest growing employers in the Australian economy, with employment rising from just 94,000 just 15 years ago. Order. And that's Senator why Cash, we... time for the answers expired. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches to supporting our resources sector? And are there any risks associated with this approach? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I have to say there are some on the other side who have done something vaguely uh, competent uh, to take the interjection from the senator, and that is, of course, the Otis Group, who themselves have expressed have expressed confidence for the resources sector uh, in this country, but unfortunately, colleagues, were shouted down by those at the top. So, a group of Labor senators who raise what we believe is actually a valid point and express, express uh, support for the resources industry and the job-creating prospects, they are not just shouted down. They are not just shouted down by the Leader of the Opposition and other members of the Labor Party, but on top of that, they are then insulted by the policy that Labor brings out in relation to net zero emissions uh, for everything for 2050. That is a job-destroying policy. So for those on the Labor side who do support, who do support growing the resources industry, I look forward Order, to watching— Order, Senator Cash. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Sen Order on my left. Senator Wish Wilson is on his feet. Senator Wish Wilson. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Minister, last year you flew to Thailand to lobby the Thai government against extraditing Hakim Al Arabi, an Australian soccer player, to Bahrain. At the time, you said publicly your intervention was because you were very concerned about Hakim's detention and very concerned about his potential extradition to Bahrain. This was the right thing to do. Minister, Given that you and your government were so vocal about Hakim's detention and the risks of his potential extradition, why have you not shown the same zeal and the same commitment to secure the release of Australian citizen and Walkley Warned winning journalist Julian Assange? Why have you not flown to the UK to lobby the UK government or to the US to lobby the US government against extraditing Julian Assange? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. 
Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator Wish Wilson for his question. Uh, on any examination of the facts of the two uh, matters which Senator Wish Wilson has put to the chamber, that of Hakeem Al Arabi and that of Julian Assange, they are qualitatively different circumstances. Uh, as the government has previously indicated, uh, we are in regular contact with the authorities in the United Kingdom in line with our consular mandate. Uh, and have uh, been assured by those uh, authorities that Mr Assange uh, is held in appropriate and humane conditions. I can also inform the chamber that I specifically raised uh, the issue of Mr Assange and his conditions in my discussions with Foreign Secretary Raab when he visited Australia uh, just a matter of uh, weeks ago. Uh, I do want to also note uh, for the chamber, and this may go to a further question from Senator Wish Wilson, at which point I would of course repeat this, this statement. Uh, it is important to note the Australian government has no standing in any of Mr Assange's legal proceedings and is unable to intervene in them. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Well, they, they certainly are different, Minister. Let me tell you why. Overnight, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Meltzer, said that Julian Assange's case is about more than one individual. He said this is a battle over press freedom, the rule of law and the future of democracy. Strong words coming from the United Nations. Minister, if you agree with the United Nations about what is at stake here, why isn't your government doing more to intervene in this case and bring Julian Assange home? More Order. than the usual Senator consular Wilson. assistance. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My personal opinion of what the Special Rapporteur may or may not have said uh, is, not, uh, is not relevant uh, in this matter. What is relevant uh, is the uh, undertakings that the Australian Government has, has sought from uh, British authorities in relation to the position, the detention of uh, Mr. Assange, uh, as, the, uh, as the proceedings are awaited. Uh, we continue to closely monitor Mr Assange's case, uh, as we would for Australians in detention overseas uh, in other contexts, and we in fact do. Uh, I know that Mr Assange has a very high public profile. Uh, for the Australian government, he is a consular client and one for whom we provide appropriate support according to our consular mandate, as I said. Uh, I do appreciate that members of the public, and including people in this chamber, self-evidently from Senator Wish Wilson's questions, uh, do feel strongly about Mr Assange's situation, but it is important to remember uh, that Australia cannot intervene in the legal processes of another country. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Minister, a few days ago it was revealed that meetings between Julian Assange and his lawyers had been secretly filmed and taped. This is a clear and egregious breach of legal professional privilege. Yep. Minister. Do you believe that Julian Assange will get a fair trial in the US, or do you agree with Nils Meltzer that, for all intents and purposes, Julian Assange is a political prisoner and he should not be extradited to the US, where he would face nothing but a politically motivated show trial? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And Senator Wish Wilson continues to uh, quote the uh, the views of uh, an individual uh, rapporteur. Um, uh, yes. Uh, Order. Of an individual uh, rapporteur who has who has ex who has uh, made a, a range of observations, not uh, all of which. Uh, uh, we agree with Mr President. As I have indicated, uh, and I am aware of the media reporting uh, uh, in relation to uh, uh, surveillance uh, of Mr Assange, uh, alleged surveillance of Mr Assange while in the Ecuadorian embassy, I don't intend to provide a running commentary on this matter, on this yeah. case. I don't provide running commentaries on legal matters uh, before courts uh, in other parts of the world, nor in Australia, frankly. Uh, and we have no standing in the legal matter that is currently before the courts. With, as, as is the case for any individual, Order. Mr Assange is entitled to due legal process, which we expect the legal Order, systems Senator in both Payne. the US and the Time UK to the deliver. Answer has expired. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Defence, Senator Reynolds. The Minister for Defence Industry has said that there are over 130 Australian companies and organisations that are subcontracted in the design phase of the future submarines. Can the minister then explain why uh, this government counts the work of French language school Alliance Francaise of Adelaide as Australian industry content for the future submarines? Wow.
the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I think I have already, at this question time, comprehensively gone through uh, what our policy is in relation to the future submarine project and Australian industry, and in terms of what stage we are at. And can I remind the senator that we are in the early design phase, and we are two years away order. from. Senator, senator Reynolds, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Thank you. Point of order is direct relevance. This is a direct quotation from the minister's junior minister. Uh, which is making an assertion about local content. Uh, we've asked the minister why Alliance Francaise is included as an indication as being one of the companies uh, that the government is counter for local content. We haven't asked about policy. We've asked about a very specific question about what is included in local content. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You've reminded her of the, the, the nature of that question. She can also respond to the quotation of the minister. Uh, but she has only been speaking for 20 seconds. I'll call the minister to continue. Hmm. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, Senator Wong might not understand the importance of the phase of the project or the senator who asked the question. However, it is incredibly important. We are still in the early design phase, and as I gave in a previous answer, we are already through Naval Group. That money is going back into the local communities, and in the cases you cited, they are South Australian companies that are employ Australians. So whether they're in a service provider or they are in a construction or manufacturing company, they are Australian companies employing Australian people. And unlike you opposite, we think that is a very good thing. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I do have one. Uh, <laughs> Can, can the uh, minister explain why this government counts media monitoring as Australian industry content for the future submarines? Scott. Order. Senator Reynolds. <laughs> well, Mr President, Senator Farrell, I've, said, I've made this point at least Order. three or four times in question time already. This is money going into Australian businesses, to local Australian communities, employing Australians. Now, you might not think that is a good thing because clearly you dismally failed in, in doing that at all. In fact, you created the valley of death. So you might not like it, but we are putting money through our contractors, order. including Senator primes. Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. Very simple question, uh, which the minister uh, uh, we'd ask her to be directly relevant to, which is why the government believes media monitoring is, should be counted as Australian industry content for future uh, uh, submarines. Uh, why is media monitoring Senator, part Senator of local Wong, content? With, with respect monitoring. to the point of order, the minister can answer it as long as she's being directly relevant. That goes, in my view, to instructing her how to answer a question. The minister was explaining the government's position on the importance of money being spent locally, I do concede that to be directly relevant. There's an opportunity after question time to debate answers. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I really don't think I've got much more to add because if Senator Wong does not understand Order. Australian companies, money going in and Australian employees, I really have nothing more to add. Mr. President? Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, I do have another question. Uh, can the minister explain why this government counts the work of the Royal Agricultural and Horticultural Society of South Australia as Australian industry content wow. for the future submarines? Wow. Senator Reynolds. As I've said about this for the sixth time, Australian companies, Australian jobs, money in Australia. Yeah. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians. Order. Senator Colbeck, can, Order. can the Minister outline the Morrison government's actions to create a stronger and more resilient Australia through our record investment in aged care? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Smith for his question and his long interest in aged care, which uh, uh, we've discussed on many, many times. Mr President, um, this government is committed to improving the aged care sector in Australia, uh, and we have delivered unprecedented investment into aged care. This year, 2019-20, uh, our investment will be 
$1.4 billion into the aged care sector, funding that goes towards some of this government's most important priorities. We are providing 44,000 additional home care packages in just the last two years, Mr. President. In the last two years alone, that's an additional investment, Mr. President, of $2.7 billion. And we can do that, Mr. President, because we've managed the budget well and we have the capacity to make these investments. Mr. President, when we came to government, there were just over 60,000 home care packages in the market, and, Mr. President. That will go to, uh, to uh, 158,000 in 2012-13, an increase of over 160 per cent, Mr. President. 160 per cent. And, Mr. President, our government is supporting 1.3 million Australians in some form of aged care across the system. And, Mr. President, our determination to ensure that we had the best aged care system possible is is demonstrated by our calling of the Royal Commission as one of Prime Minister Morrison's first acts when coming to government so that we could have the best overview of the system. We've put in place, Mr President, a new Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, and Mr President, we appreciate the support of the opposition in legislating the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission in the legislation that went through the parliament just prior to Christmas. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate what the government is doing to support the aged care needs of our old Australians and the communities they are living in? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr Order. President. Thank you, Mr President. And, and, the, and those sitting on the opposite side Order might actually think left. that this is uh, not something of note. But, Mr President, uh, our announcement on the 31st of January of $50 million towards a business, almost $50 million towards a business improvement fund, demonstrates the, our desire to ensure that aged care providers across Australia um, uh, are supported when they need if they get into difficulty. Mr. President, we have in place already a business assessment service, uh, and this new business investment, a business improvement fund provide support to aged care providers who qualify from all over Australia to help them implement strategies to improve their delivery of aged care to senior Australians. This government may, remains determined to ensure that the care provided to senior Australians across the nation is the best it possibly can be. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the new powers and authorities of the independent Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission is protecting our senior Australians and ensuring they receive quality care. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the senators opposite uh, really don't seem to have any real care about the, care, the, the importance of aged care to Australians. If we recall the, the last election, they went. To the, to the campaign with $387 billion worth of new taxes, and not one single new home care package, not a cent for workforce and not a cent for mainstream home, uh, residential care, Mr President. And providing safe, quality care is something that's important. As I said before, we do appreciate the support that the opposition gave to us in legislating to bring all the functions of quality care into one service under the Quality, uh, Aged Care Quality Safety Commission. It was an important reform that has been recommended, particularly by the carnell patterson Review. Uh, and those regulatory powers give the capacity for Australians, senior Australians, to go to one agency now in respect of all the issues that relate to their aged Order. care. Senator Colbeck. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed in an notice paper. Senator Patrick. President, pursuant to Standing Order 1643, I seek explanation from the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia as to why Order for Production No. 255 relating to New South Wales water access licences has not been complied with. Our Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I am advised that there are a large number of documents under this order. I understand, though, that Senator Patrick has been working with the former Minister for Water Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, National Dis Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Mr David Littleproud, on this particular issue. 
Um, I have made contact with the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Mr Keith Pitt, uh, and I'm advised that the government will work constructively with you to provide the Senate with the documents that you seek. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the Minister's answers. I will point out, however, that this uh, OPD is now 13 weeks overdue, uh, and it is an OPD of importance. So let me provide some context as to why it's important. Uh, for people that are not familiar with the Murray-Darling Basin system, there are three main rivers, uh, uh, substantive rivers in the Murray-Darling, uh, the Murray River, the Darling River and the Murrumbidgee. Uh, the Murray River flows, of course, from, uh, uh, from the east across to South Australia and provides uh, South Australia with its water entitlement. The, uh, the, uh, Darling River flows from the northern basin uh, down uh, past Menindi, where the fish kills uh, took place last year, uh, and into the Murray River to contribute to South Australia's water entitlement. Except we've got a problem, and that is that the Darling is dry. The Darling River ha is, is, is dry, and uh, we've been in a situation that, uh, for the first time since, uh, uh, since settlement, uh, Talano Station in particular, and I've been there a, a few times now, uh, Talano Station has been without flowing wa water flowing past its property on the Darling uh, uh, since 1851. Never has it been uh, not flowing for more than three months. Uh, that, uh, that situation changed in, uh, in uh, 2015. The, water, the, the river is bone dry. And what that means is that instead of having the Darling River, the northern basin, feeding down through the Darling River into the Murray, uh, we now have to rely on the Murray itself, the entire uh, Murray-Darling, uh, uh, sorry, the entire Murray River, to provide all of South Australia's water. Now, uh, people in this place might remember uh, protests we had outside of uh, Parliament and protests that took place in northern New South, uh, sorry, southern New South Wales and Victoria in relation to their lack of ability to pump water from the Murray. And it's not that the Murray's not full. It's simply that uh, they can't afford to buy the water that is passing their property because it has to meet uh, South Australia's water obligation. It's not South Australia's fault. The fault is that instead of getting 40 per cent of our water coming from the Darling, there's none. There's no water coming from uh, the Darling River into the uh, uh, into the Murray, hugely problematic. And uh, this all rests uh, or comes down to the incompetence of the New South Wales government in managing its river system. It, uh, it's, it's failed to properly manage the Northern Basin. It's failed to uh, even lodge uh, its water sharing plans under the Murray Darling Basin plan. And uh, look, uh, former Minister Little Proud uh, and I didn't agree on a lot in terms of the Murray Darling. Uh, he, he would often call me uh, cotton killer and I'd often call him river killer. But we did actually agree on the fact that, uh, that, that it is uh, quite proper for the, for the government, the federal government, to withhold funds from New South Wales until such time as they lodge those uh, water sharing pl plans. Now, of course, we all know there's been a fair amount of rain uh, in Queensland and New South Wales. What we would have thought, uh, what I would have thought, uh, would have happened, would, was that we would use uh, that water to have a first flush through the river system, to allow water fl to, to flow down through the uh, through the river system to get the uh, the Darling River flowing back into the Murray. That would would have provided relief for irrigators in southern New South Wales and northern Victoria. So in some sense, the uh, New South Wales government are cutting their nose off in spite of their face. What they've done in this instance is instead of placing an embargo—in fact, they did place an embargo for a very short period of time, and then they lifted it for some reason. Instead of allowing water to get to uh, communities that need it and to get all the way down uh, the Darling to the Murray, uh, they've started pumping again. They've started flood floodplain harvesting. They've, uh, they've started pumping again, and that, 
as I said, will uh, perhaps advantage some, some of the irrigators in the northern basin, but will severely disadvantage uh, irrigators in uh, Victoria and uh, southern New South Wales. So, uh, and we have a, a perverse situation where, when the Queensland rain started in February, uh, New South Wales Water Minister uh, uh, Pavey basically came out and complained that Queensland wasn't letting water flow down into, uh, into New South Wales. And yet, when the rain starts to flow in New South Wales, she doesn't let water flow down the Darling River, the Barker uh, River, uh, instead letting irrigators take that. Now, I'm kind of sick of New South Wales. Every time uh, there's a problem with the river, they threaten to pull out of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. They threaten to pull out of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan when, uh, uh, when this parliament uh, or when the Senate uh, blocked changes to the Northern Basin uh, when the Northern Basin Review was uh, underway. When the Labor Party uh, proposed uh, lifting the 1,500 gigalitre cap on water buybacks, New South Wales uh, 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 spat the dummy again and came out threatening to leave the plan. Uh, they've done it several times in relation to the 450 gigalitres of, of, of efficiency measures, something that's built into the plan and to which they agreed. Um, they are like the petulant child. Um, it's their mismanagement that has stopped water flowing uh, from the northern basin down into uh, uh, the uh, through the lower Darling and into the Murray River, which would provide relief for irrigators in Victoria and New South Wales. As I said, they're cutting their, uh, their nose off in spice, spite of their face. Now, now I want to go to the Murrumbidgee because that's what this OPD was about. Similar uh, story. The Murrumbidgee is another river that feeds into the Murray. And we're looking at a situation where we've got some alpha irrigators. Uh, that the, an alpha irrigator is someone who believes that any water flows that flows past their property will be wasted. So they take as much, it, uh, as much of it as they possibly can. We've got these alpha irrigators building storage uh, 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 dams up in uh, uh, places uh, like Hay, near Hay, uh, and their aim is to cap capture supplementary water that would have otherwise flowed into the, uh, into the Murray. Uh, and that's exactly what this OPD was about. It's a disturbing and, and fairly a dumb thing to do. Uh, it's, it's really driven by greed. Uh, and OPD uh, 255 sought to gain access to information about how, uh, uh, how those storage dams came about, and it really did uh, flow from or, or uh, stem from the ABC's Four Corners report into, the, uh, uh, into uh, that scenario in their, in their cash splash uh, program. Um, so it's for that reason that uh, this is uh, quite an important uh, order for production of documents. Uh, the Senate does need to see what is happening along the Murrumbidgee. It's an important infeed into the Murray River, uh, just like the Darling River is, and we need to start being uh, sensible. I understand there are many stakeholders across the, across the river system. That includes irrigators and, of course, uh, tourism operators, the environment, indigenous people. To, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, tourist operators, lots and lots of different stakeholders, and we do want to share the water about, but that doesn't seem to be what's happening here. We get our first rains, uh, we, instead of having a, 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 f a flush of the river system uh, and then getting everyone back to normal, everyone getting their fair share, that hasn't been happening. We need to examine what is going on on the Murrumbidgee, and that's why it's important for this uh, OPD to be uh, responded to in an open and transparent manner. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. On the same matter to Senator Watt? No. Oh, okay. So the question is that um, the Senate take note of the motion as moved by Senator Patrick. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Rustin and Reynolds to the questions asked by Senator Ciccone and myself. Uh, Obviously, one of the big issues that's dominating political discussion at the moment is climate change, 
its impact on our economy, its impact on jobs and its impact on the environment. And one of the reasons why this debate is so alive at the moment uh, is the shocking bushfires that we saw over the summer break uh, and the predictions from so the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology and many other scientific groups that we face similar, uh, in fact more and more severe natural disasters into the future as a result of climate change. And that's one of the reasons why federal Labor has in the last few days announced its commitment, uh, should we be elected at the next election, to uh, ensure that Australia becomes carbon neutral by 2050. Now, to start with, what does that mean? What that means is simply uh, that we would, as a country, absorb or offset at least as much pollution as we emit into the atmosphere. And I note, in fact, that the government has made the very same commitment by signing Australia up to international agreements at the Paris Convention uh, about four or five years ago. The government has made exactly the same commitment at what Labor has announced. Uh, you wouldn't know that from the reaction from the government. Uh, many people, from Senator Canavan to the Prime Minister himself, running around calling Chicken Little, saying that the whole world will fall in in Australia, that every industry in Australia will fall over, that every job in Australia will disappear. So, if that's the case, you have to wonder why it is that the government itself has made the very same commitment. Uh, I can't imagine that this government would want to see every industry or every job disappear, uh, and they wouldn't have signed up to that commitment if it actually would have that effect. And that's why it is so patently false for the government to con continue going around making these comments. Uh, as has already been said by a number of people, um, in some respects there's nothing revolutionary about this commitment. It's something that more than 70 countries around the world have already committed to, and some of our biggest emitters in the corporate world in Australia, whether it be BP, Shell, Santos, Origin, Qantas, BHP, these are companies that you know, create a lot of emissions as well as creating a lot of jobs. So they've decided that they can uh, reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And I ask the government, why is it that these companies, some of the biggest emitters in this country, are capable of doing this, but it's so terrible and disastrous an idea for Australia as a country to do so? One of the other groups that has also made a commitment around carbon neutrality is Meat and Livestock Australia, which represents the beef industry in this country. And not only have they made a commitment to reach carbon neutrality, uh, but they are aiming uh, to become, for their industry to be carbon neutral by 2030, 20 years ahead of Labor's commitment to reach this point by 2050. Now again, uh, the beef industry and agriculture in general is one of the bigger emitting industries in this country. It creates a lot of jobs, it creates a lot of export dollars, but it also creates a lot of emissions. So you would think that if there was one industry that would be concerned about signing up to carbon neutrality in any decade coming, coming forward, it would be the agriculture industry and, in particular, the beef industry. But they've done that. They've, they, they, have a uh, they are aiming to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. And it's no surprise, because between 2005 and 2016, the beef industry actually reduced its emissions by 60 per cent. This shows this can be done. This does not mean the end of the beef industry or agriculture. This can be done. And why are they doing so? Well, their managing director, Richard Norton, has said, and I quote, achieving this goal of carbon neutrality would put Australia head and shoulders above its competitors. This is actually an economically sensible thing to do for the beef industry. This is not just about the environmental benefits which we will all gain uh, by reducing our emissions. This is actually the economically sensible thing to do, because the beef industry, like so many others, knows that the cost of doing nothing, as the government would have us do, is far higher than the cost of actually taking on action on climate change. Now, Senator Rustin, in her answers, uh, you know, sought to deny, in the spirit of this government's approach to climate denialism, sought to deny uh, the, the commitment of the MLA and then went on to deny and reject the premise of the question when we put to her figures that were actually provided by the federal government's own bodies. ABARES, the Australian Bureau of Agriculture and Resources, Economics and Sciences, has said that over the last two decades more than $1 billion has been wiped from annual agricultural production due to climate change. The agriculture industry knows uh, that becoming carbon neutral is not only good for the environment, it's good for their bottom line. The claims that government members are making that this industry and other industries will die are simply wrong. Thank you, Senator. What? Senator Seselja. Thank you, Deputy President. And, 
Um, I'd just like to start by commenting on, I guess, the, the cruelty of the Labor Party's uh, tactics group, which keeps sort of humiliating their own senators with their line of questioning, which never fails, never fails to highlight their absolute inadequacies in any given number of policy areas. And I think it's particularly harsh to be to be leading out with Senator Murray Watt, who was along with his left-wing colleagues, the author of the strategy at the last election to make it a climate change election, uh, which worked out so beautifully for them, uh, not just around the country, but most particularly where Senator Murray Watt was leading the charge uh, in the great state of Queensland, uh, where the Labor Party, in making it a climate change election, managed to poll at roughly 22 per cent of the primary vote. So I would like to first comment on the absolute abject cruelty of Labor's uh, question time strategy when it comes to highlighting their inadequacies. You know, when, they when they ask about aged care, we're reminded uh, about the fact that they had $387 billion of new taxes and not one dollar, not one dollar for aged care. When they ask about uh, defence, we are reminded of the fact that the Labor Party lowered the defence budget as a proportion of GDP to about the lowest in this country since World War II, and we have been picking up the slack since. And when we talk about climate change and when they ask questions about climate change, we are reminded, uh, Deputy President, about the Labor Party's abject failure when it came to policies in this space. Despite imposing a carbon tax that they promised they would not impose on the Australian people, guess what? When the Labor Party were in government, they were still on track not to meet the 2020 Kyoto targets. So not only, not only did they impose this economy-destroying tax, which we had to come and repeal in 2014, uh, in 2013-14, uh, they, they were still on track not to meet their Kyoto targets. So they imposed all of the economic pain on the Australian people uh, without any of the environmental gain. Well, what did we do? We came in. With our direct action, well, no, no. You say, I, I will tell you what we did. I will tell you what we did in comparison. So we have, on the one hand, the Labor Party's record, which was a carbon tax, a carbon Order. tax they promised not to deliver, but did deliver, but a failure to meet the 2020 targets. That was where we were on track. Then the coalition comes in, uh, repeals the carbon tax, grows the economy, and guess what? We meet our 2020 targets. Now, now the Labor Party can only argue about whether or not carryover credits should be used because we were able to achieve our targets, targets that they were. I mean, of course they wouldn't use carryover credits if the Labor Party were in because they were on track not to meet the targets. You only get the carryover credits if you overachieve. If you underachieve, you don't get to use the carryover credits. So uh, that is a fundamental difference uh, between us. But I've got to say that. It is, it is particularly cruel in the last couple of days, and I do have sympathy for some of my Labor Senate colleagues who have been sent out by the tactics group. Members of the Otis group have been, have been sent out to, to, to lead the charge on climate change questioning, and I think that is particularly cruel because like when we saw that the Otis group had formed and they gathered and they got together and they had fine feral wines and you know, delicious foods and God knows what their carbon footprint was, but we won't get into that. They, they got together to try and fight and argue for more sensible policy when it came to the balance between emissions reductions and supporting jobs, supporting industry. Uh, little, did we know, little did we know that only a few days after the emergence of this group uh, that this get-together was in fact a meeting of surrender. Uh, we, we saw the 2050 net emissions reduction, net zero emissions reduction announced only a few days after the Otis Group came out. It appears that that meeting was a, a, a declaration of surrender by the more sensible people within the Labor Party who have been completely rolled. Now, where Anthony Albanese is taking the Labor Party and where he wants to take the Australian people is to a place where our economy suffers, where jobs are lost, where we have higher electricity prices, and if your record when you were last in government 
follows, you still won't achieve the targets because you were absolutely useless at thank delivering you, it Senator last time. Senator Selger, your time has expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Well, that contribution has just shown us why the, this government has thrown up the white flag in terms of action on climate change. That contribution was more interested in talking about every other issue other than climate change. Certainly didn't talk about the numerous uh, industry uh, associations that actually support the uh, target that the Labor Party has announced. Hasn't, didn't even go there. Not interested. He's one of the deniers. Another, one of the climate change deniers. And you know, I want to say that you know the most ardent opponents of, uh, on, of action to mitigate the dangerous effects of climate change in this government are the supposed defenders of the bush. The National Party seems determined to use every ounce of their influence in government to see the, the value of our agricultural production in this nation plummet. They'd rather satisfy the climate change deniers that form the ever-dwindling membership base of their rump of a party than do something to support our farmers. And we know why, Madam Deputy President, because they're scared of one nation, petrified the weak leadership of their leader in the face of growing electoral competition will spell the demise of their party. But the future of this nation's agricultural capacity and output is far too important to leave neglected, to leave neglected simply because of the internal politics of the National Party and the coalition and make it too hard for this government to address. Because the effects of dangerous climate change are already severely impacting our agricultural capacity, productivity and output, and this is only set to worsen. And how do we know this? Well, because ABARES have quantified the financial impact borne by our farming sector due to the drying of our climate and increasing temperatures. In their report, ABARES found that changes in our climate since the year 2000 have reduced the average broadacre farm's profits by a whopping 22 per cent—22 per cent in 20 years. That's an average loss in profit of 18,600 per year per farm. For cropping farmers, considered the most exposed to climate change, annual pro farm profits have fallen by 35 per cent. That equates to a loss in profit of $70,900. Nationally, ABARES calculates that more than one billion has been wiped from the value of Australia's annual crop production in the last 20 years due to the effects of climate change. Deputy President, farmers are only too acutely aware of the impact dangerous climate change is having on their viability, yield and profitability. That's why they're crying out for the, their government, the national government, to take action to put us on a path towards sustainability, a pathway to net zero emissions. The livestock, uh, Meat and Livestock Australia have said that they believe a zero carbon footprint is possible for their sector by 2030. 2030. In fact, since 2005, the beef industry has already reduced its emissions by around 60 per cent making net zero very achievable. But if the government won't believe the industry associations, perhaps they should listen to one of their own. Niall Blair, former New South Wales Minister for Primary Industry and Deputy Leader of the New South Wales Nationals, known as the Professor of Food Sustainability at Charles Sturt University, has written an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald today, praising Federal Labor's announcement of a net zero emissions target by 2050. Mr Blair notes the opportunity this provides the agricultural sector across this nation to diversify and thrive. He says, and I quote, a net zero emissions future in Australia provides nothing but opportunities for our farmers, and with 30 years to get there, they are willing, ready, willing and able. It's all it's also the right thing to do. 
Granted, we need details, innovation and research and costings, but if we get it right, we can capitalise on the opportunities and leave behind those who are doing the scaremongering. Their future awaits us, and we shouldn't fear it. The minister's uh, unfortunate response to questions today clearly indicates that Senator this Brown, will not— Thank you, Senator Brown. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. As uh, Senator Seselja was just outlining there, really, Labor is just incredibly cruel, incredibly cruel uh, to their members in the Senate that are uh, actively uh, wanting to see the Labor Party adopt some sensible, uh, quality projects. Uh, but they're also very, very cruel to the Australian people. Uh, this is, I think, the nub of the issue. They're taking the Australian people for mugs. By setting up uh, this bright, shiny target that's somewhere off in the way, 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 never, never, 2050, uh, to, to try to convince the Australian people that they actually have a plan to deal with what is a very serious issue for not only this country but indeed for the planet. And they're proposing a target of net zero by 2050, but they really have no plan whatsoever. How do we know that? Because the first target, which ought to be uh, recognised and ought to be laid out very clearly in this place so we actually get to understand what it is they're on about, would be a 2030 target. But do they have a 2030 target? No, we don't know what it is. There's no plan. These guys really don't have any plan to deal with what would otherwise be a very, very serious issue. Labor has not learned from their climate policy mistake. Their net zero emissions target by 2050 is a target without a plan to get there, and a 2050 target is no substitute for the 2030 target. Now, uh, speaking of people that I think they've been dudded and, uh, and been cruel to, uh, let me talk about Joel Fitzgibbon, the, uh, the member in the other place. Uh, in October last year, Joel Fitzgibbon was running around calling on the Labor Party to drop its emissions reductions target and adopt the coalition's policy of 26 to 28 per cent by 2030. But this week, he has backflipped, penning an article in the Newcastle Herald in support of Labor's uh, new net zero emissions target. Now, maybe he's changed his mind because Mike Freelander, Mark Dreyfus, other members in, in the other place, uh, uh, Tanya Plibersek and Catherine King, have slapped him down. But maybe uh, he's Senator changed his mind. Normally I'll I take wait your until point. people I just have can't concluded remember their, their uh, particular. Just put a, a other in other members, uh, members in the other place have said that uh, uh, maybe he's changed his mind for another reason. Uh, you know, last year, uh, Mr Fitzgibbon stated that Labor needs to reach a sensible settlement on climate change. How many times are we going to let it kill us, is what he said. Indeed, how many leaders do we want to lose, he said. It seems Mr Fitzgibbon has decided which Labor leader should be lost next, because this Labor leader has no plan to actually deal with, with this problem that we have, this, these emissions targets. And they're treating the Australian people for mugs. And I think that that is absolutely disgraceful, because they cannot front up to the Australian people and tell them what it's going to cost and how many jobs it's going to lose, particularly if you're living in regional Australia, where we know there are challenges that they are facing. And they're not prepared to front up and, uh, and, and deal and explain to the Australian people what's actually going on. For example, Labor is at it again with regard to a carbon tax. Uh, Labor has been citing the CSIO, CSIRO report, uh, the Australian National Outlook 2019 report, to support their target with no plan. But what Labor won't tell you is that the CSIRO have modelled a, uh, sorry, a $273 carbon price to get to net zero emissions by 2050. The CSIRO says producers and consumers bear the cost of achieving emissions reductions. So what does this mean? Well, to achieve this target, see the CSIRO shows sh uh, sheep, crop and cattle production falls off a cliff decimating regional towns and hurting Australian families and businesses that rely on agri agriculture and their livelihood. 
Anthony Albanese, the Leader of the Opposition, failed seven times to rule out a carbon tax when asked on insiders, and Joel Fitzgibbon has followed suit. They cannot explain. They're not prepared to be upfront to the Australian people about what this will cost them, how many jobs will be lost, what is this going to cost the economy. And they're not prepared to do that because they have no plan. They just got it out there on the never-never, thinking it's some big shiny target they can fool the Australian people. But the Australian people are not fooled, just like they weren't All at the last Senator election. O'Sullivan. Senator Pratt. Mr President, so today in rising to take note of answers from the Minister for Defence and the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture. We've seen uh, in their answers and in those uh, members opposite, as they also take note of answers, uh, how they continue to perpetuate that uh, acting on climate change is the end of the beef industry, end of the transport industry and the end of the mining industry. But it's rubbish. I, did he I heard uh, uh, Senator Rushton call Labor's policy reckless. Well, what we have seen here from this government is entirely reckless. You are playing with the future uh, of our industries, the future of our economy and, indeed, the future of our planet by refusing to take meaningful action on climate change and to give our nation the policy security that it needs. We've seen industry already responding uh, to this policy vacuum with their own plans and targets uh, for carbon pollution. Companies like Qantas, Telstra, Santos, they have already committed their companies to zero net emissions by 2050. The energy minister, Mr Angus Beef, oh no, sorry, Mr Angus Taylor, has said that net zero emissions will slash the beef industry. Well, Minister, even the red meat industry has a target of net zero emissions, but their ambition is to be wonderfully, it is to be carbon neutral by 2030. As we know, the MLA has conducted its own research, and indeed, its research funded and developed hand in hand with this Commonwealth government. The report has identified it is possible to become carbon neutral and Meat and Livestock Australia will develop business models to unlock productivity for industry. They've discussed how they want to be and are part of the solution and shifting the narrative. Pip Band said at Climate Week, Panel discussion was one of the ways we are working to shift the narrative from red meat as the climate villain to one where livestock producers are part of the solutions and seen as climate heroes. Now, I think that is great news. On the other hand, what we see from this government is going to play straight into the Go Vegan for the Planet campaigners as you decry uh, uh, a sustainable future by setting up uh, this you, you can't act on climate change and save this industry. That is the narrative you set up. You can't save uh, the beef and livestock industry. You can't save that industry if you also want to act on climate change. Well, that is false, and we will fight for the jobs uh, of our nation. Business in Australia is already doing a lot. Flinders & Co became the first meat company in the world to fully offset carbon emissions from their business, from every kilogram of meat that they sell. Maybe the minister should try talking up business instead of playing into the scared tactics that you so love to employ. What is really of concern for industry, all industries in our nation, is the impact of doing nothing. And we already see this playing out all over the country. We see existing stranded capital as technologies and economies change, where you have refused to put plans in place to facilitate that change, to protect jobs and to protect consumers. The impact of climate change is detrimental to red meat producers. It's impacting grasslands that support livestock, 
More than a billion dollars has been wiped from the valleys of Australia's annual crop production over the last 20 years already. You can see in the southwest of Western Australia a 20 per cent decline in rainfall in some of our uh, most productive ag agricultural areas. So, in closing, the Prime Minister's inaction on climate change is a recipe for higher power prices, fewer jobs, lower wages, and slower economic growth. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Ciccone be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, I, I seek to. Uh I rise to uh, take note of the uh, response to my question to uh, Foreign Minister Senator Payne. Um, the standard response this government has had to any question asked about Australian citizen Julian Assange, award-winning journalist who is being extradited to the US for uncovering their war crimes, the standard response has been that uh, this government doesn't intervene in any foreign uh, legal process involving other countries. Well, I asked a question to Senator Payne today that clearly shows that is not the case. Last year, Senator Payne personally flew to Thailand to lobby the Thai government against the extradition of Hakim Al Arabi, an Australian soccer player who was being extradited to Bahrain. Now, the minister claimed today, and I'll go back and have a look at Hansard, but claim today that the cases are very different. Well, once again, I beg to differ. Let me, let me tell you, it was very clear when I saw the Australian story that, was, uh, that featured around uh, the, the, the work uh, of a number of high-profile Australians to help secure the release of, um, of Hakim, that he was a political prisoner in Thailand and he was going to be sent back to Bahrain uh, to face potential torture harm even a death sentence. Um, let me tell you what the UN Rapporteur on Torture said last night, Nils Melter, and tell me that there's no similarities here between these two cases. He says the extradition of Julian Assange is a modern show trial. And he says the case of Julian Assange is nothing else than a modern show trial featuring politically motivated prosecutors, denial of justice, manipulated evidence, biased judges, unlawful surveillance, denial of defence rights and abusive prison conditions. What sounds like a textbook example of dictatorial arbitrariness is in fact an actual precedent happening in the middle of Europe, the birthplace of human rights. And it is our ally and friend, the United States, that he is talking about here, not Bahrain, not a country in the Middle East with a record of human rights abuses. This is the United States of America that the UN is talking about. And I recommend senators read this report that was out last night. The language is extraordinary. It is extraordinary that this has come from the UN about the case of Julian Assange. Now, the minister said, as I just mentioned, that the two cases are quite different. Well, I would agree in the sense that, yes, they are quite different, because the UN is clearly saying, as by the way is just about every journalist around the world, the ones who are speaking out in defence of journalistic freedom and trying to oppose the criminalisation of journalism, all the major uh, outlets around the world are also saying the same thing, that this case is unique because it is not about an individual anymore. It is about freedom of speech. It is about journalistic integrity. It is about the rights of an Australian citizen. That's what's at stake here. In fact, the UN rapporteur said last night, this is ultimately about democracy and whether we want a totalitarian regime that we all sit under. And I would ask the minister to reflect on her answers as to why and perhaps provide to this chamber or to Australians who care deeply about the torture and the extradition of Julian Assange to explain why these cases are different. Well, I know why they're different, because the US is a close ally and a friend of ours. We have an ANZUS treaty with this country. 
I understand there's a lot at stake with our close friend and ally, but because they're a close friend and ally, that's exactly why we have a relationship where we should be adults with our ally. And we should say this is simply unacceptable. You cannot extradite an Australian citizen who has rights on the basis of a breach, on the basis of the breach of a US law. If this precedent occurs, this is extremely dangerous. Today it's Julian Assange. Tomorrow it could be your son or your daughter or your brother. This is an egregious abuse of power, an appalling abuse of power by our friend and ally, the US. This parliament has been silent for too long. I ask senators to speak out on Order, this case Senator and bring Wilson, Julian Assange Please resume home. your seat. The que question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I note the previous question I put was actually moved by Senator Watt, not Senator Ciccone. My apologies. Um,